This week's presentation, the El Camino de Santiago de Compostela, presented by Paula Harvey and Kate Derry. Why would someone pushing 70 make the conscious decision to trudge an average of 18 miles a day through rugged, unknown terrain? Crazy. Crazy. What could be the appeal in hiking up and down endless hills for more than a month with all your belongings strapped to your back? Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> I start to sound like a Methodist. Okay. <laughs> Call out at the right moment. <laughs> and at the close of each exhausting day where the, trout, where the rewards of sleeping in a bunk bed in a room with 20 strangers vying for only one bathroom. <laughs> okay, none of us want to go anymore. I don't want to do this for me. Canadian expat Kate did just that, not once but three times, on the French route of El Camino. Paula, an expat from the U.S., took the proverbial road less traveled by trekking the North Way. Paula and Kate will describe their experiences and speak about the important things they learned on this journey of a lifetime. And Paula is going to start us out, and then Kate will join her later. Please welcome Paula. <laughs> Kat, we need to do the meditation first. Oh, yes, David has a wonderful I'm never going to be perfect. Uh, my name is David Bryan. But ain't one thing, it's another. Sometimes Kat gets a little... Uh, <laughs> um, this morning I want to dedicate the, the meditation to Paula and Kate, and uh, I'm going to read a poem called A Journey by Mary Oliver. Okay, thank you. Louder, please. I'm going to read a poem, The Journey by Mary Oliver, and dedicate it to Kate and Paula. And after I read the poem, I want to have you look inside and find your own traveler and pay heed to that. So here's the poem. One day, you finally knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice. Though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the, the old tug at your ankles. Mend my life, mend my life, each voice cried. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible, it was already late enough, and the wild night, and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. So oh, please, please find your own journey. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own. That kept you company as 
as you throw deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you can do, determined to save the only life you can save. Now, Paula. Now, Paula. <laughs> Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. When I was asked to speak at Open So Far about my experience walking the El Camino, I did this in the spring of 2013. I thought about it. But not being a writer, much less a public speaker, I wrote an email simply thanking Margaret for the opportunity, but I think I'll pass at this time. But before I hit and my brother, who was visiting me at the time here, said I should do it. You were comfortable planning the trip and getting on a plane to cross the ocean, he said, but you were out of your comfort zone with the idea of walking 18 miles a day with only a backpack to hold your possession for the next 30 days. Then he reminded me that I had just finished telling him it was the walk of my lifetime and one of the highlights of my life. He was right. Stepping out of my comfort zone in the past has added unexpected value to my life. So, here I am. I've been coming to this beautiful place off and on for over 30 years before I retired here from San Francisco in 2009. <clears throat> Who am I? I like adventure and fun. I'm always wondering what's around the next corner. And I believe that when the day is done, good or bad, it is what it is. I am thankful for the love, peace, and joy in my life. I'm also someone who likes the idea of being physically fit but I lack discipline in that area. <laughs> I am not someone who likes to exercise, and I avoid doing anything that involves sweating or pain of any kind. <laughs> because of this, when I retired, I decided not to have a car. I figured this would force me to walk where I needed to go. Walking served me well in Mexico. However, I was blessed with five grandsons in my 60s, which found me on the floor doing puzzles, playing games, or hanging out. Of course, this was wonderful. But in order to get back up, I had to get on all fours, <laughs> hold on to something sturdy to pull myself back up. And trust me, that makes one feel very old. So, about uh, a couple years after I moved here, Annie Green walked into my life and put a whole new spin on getting in shape. She motivated me to meet her personal trainer, Ron, who had a gym in his house. I agreed to sign up for one hour, three days a week, for a month. I never ever liked going to the gym. But I did like how I felt after I did the work. So I did show up for two years. And I should mention, about the same time, I was fortunate to meet Wayne Lent, who was starting a kayak club. I was one of the founding members of that kayak club. So now I have a third physical activity. Slowly, I could feel myself getting stronger. And unbeknownst to me, I was getting in shape for the walk of my lifetime. It all started when my good friend, Bill Heim, was going to walk the El Camino de San Diego. And bang, there's more than 1,000 years of history and tradition 
associated with the Camino de Santiago, or as, as it is also called, the Way of St. James. It is a pilgrimage to Santiago, specifically to the Cathedral of Santiago Compostela, where legend has it that the remains of Jesus' Apostle St. James lie. In medieval times, this journey was taken for serious religious reasons. The pilgrim, he or she, was seeking forgiveness of sins or uh, St. James' assistance in some manner. Today, people's reasons range from religious to spiritual, to history and cultural, to sports. There are many different routes one can take to San Diego. And um, if you look at this map over here, I identified three of them. It's not, it's not perfect. Somebody was trying to uh, identify certain towns, but the North Way, which is along the Bay of Biscay that I marked in black, was the route that I took with, with Bill. Um, can you see the green that goes kind of parallel? The green is the more popular way that um, Kate took, called the French route. And then Bill has gone three times now, too, but his second one um, that I very kindly declined going with him um, was from down here all the way up. So you get the idea that there are a lot of different routes one can take. I am, um, you know, uh, when I asked, when I started asking Bill questions about his walk, he told me I should join him. At first I laughed at the thought of walking 500 miles with a backpack. <laughs> but finally, after a month of some sleepless nights, thinking about doing this at the young age of 68, I decided to step out of my comfort zone and go for it. I had always liked the idea of hiking the Appalachian Trail for a few days with a backpack, but the opportunity never came up. This was the universe through Bill finally giving me the opportunity to do something I thought I'd like to do. And remember, I said, I'd like a venture. Um, so this was going to be a big adventure. Bill told me he was doing the North Way, which was 540 miles and would take about 30 days. When I asked him why the North Way and not the French route, which is more popular, he said because it was harder. <laughs> I ignored the word harder and the fact that he is an ex-Marine that believes pain is normal. <laughs> Having lived most of my adult life on or near the water, I thought only of the beautiful views of nature I would see, especially since the path followed along the water 80% of the time. But I had a secret. I knew this was really going to be a trek, a long and difficult walk. So I promised myself that I could stop after three days and be satisfied. With that settled, I jumped in with both feet and purchased my ticket to Madrid. I now had two months to get ready. Now, with certainly, um, the two years made a big difference. So I knew I could walk a long time on flat surfaces, but could I go up and down, over and over, for most of the day? I started to hike up to the chapel and the cornfield. I have to tell you, it was very embarrassing. I had to stop every few minutes to get my breath, literally. But slowly and surely, I was finally able to walk up with just brief uh, rest stops at the chapel and again at the cornfield. So, being someone who loved to plan and make lists, one of my favorite parts of the walk was preparing my backpack. To give you an idea, this is my backpack, specially fitted for me from REI. I had the challenge of keeping it at 15 pounds 
or less. I came in with water. I have a, uh, a bladder inside here, which I filled with water every day and then drank from this hose. I came in at about 18 pounds. I did spend um, premium money to buy things that were really light. Uh, and I have to tell you, after a few days wearing that on the walk, it begins to feel like part of your body. So every day, for 34 days, this is what I wore. And in fact, you'll see a picture of me. This top is exactly what I wore. The pants are not, because I'm 20 pounds heavier. And um, the, boots, the boots are not. But this is what every day. Um, this is my rain jacket. My favorite color green. It weighs less than a uh, small loaf of bread. This was my evening wear. When I, uh, when I finished walking for the day, I would put this on. And I use Ziploc bags because you can press out the air and it allows more space in the uh, backpack. My nightgown, long underwear, and uh, additional change of uh, underwear. This is my Eileen Fisher scarf. <laughs> now, it has my favorite color green and blue, so it reminds me of the sea. You know, you might wonder why would you bring this seemingly unnecessary item. Well, a girl needs to have some sense of luxury, especially on a trek. <laughs> <laughs> so I use this at night to cover my pillow or as a shawl to dress up my evening wear, which is very similar to what I'm wearing, by the way. It was a skirt instead of pants. I sometimes use it as a towel to dry myself after a shower. This, does anyone have an idea what this is? It took me, it took me three purchases to get the, the smallest, lightest, medium weight, full size uh, sleeping bag. Now, it is mummy style, so you can see the uh, bottom comes in like this. I have a picture. <laughs> and you can see my, my beautiful scarf. The major drawback was the fact that once you put your feet in, you couldn't move them. <laughs> After walking all day, you would think your legs would be happy to be still. But most nights, they seem to want to keep moving. So I would struggle to get one leg out at a time and do some stretching exercises. And I just do hope you've noticed color coordinated. <laughs> I also carried extra lightweight sandals, which I was very thankful for when the day was done and the boots came off. Unfortunately, they were so light that they were not suitable for walking any distance. They were the first thing I got rid of when I came back to the state. Given my toes, which I'll explain later, I would have agreed to carry the extra weight of some good walking sandals. So, this Ziploc bag holds my little brush, my soap to do laundry, to wash my body, wash my hair, um, my tooth. I forgot to put the toothbrush in today, but it had a toothbrush. It had nails on, never know when you need that. And it had my blood pressure medication. Fortunately, I don't wear makeup and I don't blow dry my hair, so that was good. <laughs> On day three, an unplanned for but very necessary large bottle of ice cream was added to the backpack. 
my toes started to get sore. And the pain in my right butt was back. Yes, on the plane trip to Spain, I noticed discomfort in my right butt. I think I strained it because during the week before leaving, I had done my squats like Annie Green does, which is much lower than I normally did. The ibuprofen did get rid of that pain in my back side, but not in my toes. And so around 15 days into the walk, I took uh, a couple days off and I went and saw a doctor. Short of stopping the walk, the advice was to take my boot off every one to two hours and massage my toes. And that did help, but my toes did continue to give me a lot of grief. Notice I did not pull out an iPad or an iPhone. <laughs> Once I arrived in Spain, Bill did give me a prepaid phone so we could stay connected, but I often forgot I had it. I have been connected 24-7 for 32 years in my work, and when I retired, I took a hammer to my black face. <laughs> and I'm very happy to hear that you know what a blackberry is, because someone said, oh, they won't know. I said, yeah, the cloud's old enough. I said, don't know what a blackberry is. So when we were not connecting at whatever the next stop was, I would just accept the fact that I might be on my own. Bill, meanwhile, was texting me. Now, I had no idea what texting was at that time, <laughs> much less how to do it. I never did catch on to the whole texting thing on the walk, but Bill, you will be happy to know that my grandson has finally got me trained and I am a first class texter today. <laughs> I even know how to play Pokemon Go. <laughs> This one held my passport, my money, my credit card, my plane ticket, my life. Okay, this one little baggage. Um, it also had the um, passport for the El Camino. When you begin the El Camino, you will get a passport. And um, each night when you get to an arbiter, which is like um, a youth hostel uh, in America, it's a inexpensive group lodging place that may or may not provide food. You would receive a stamp in your passport to prove that you've been there. So, just stand. Nice. Now, directions and places to stay where Daily John, Kate, had told us we were crazy to do the North Way, as the infrastructure was not in place, um, especially on places to eat or sleep. A pamphlet that Kate gave us had directions that were pure comedy, provided you did not rely on them. For example, I said, look for the purple house. <laughs> Go 100 feet and turn left. And then look for the field of daisies and take the small footpath to the right. What information we did have was from different blogs and stores on Bill's Kindle Fire. Unfortunately, his backpack was just too heavy because he didn't listen. We told him how to pack it, but being a guy, he had to do it his way. So day four, we ended up shipping his Kindle Fire and some other items, such as a journal that he was keeping um, that was about that thick hardcover. I mean, it really comes down to how much weight you're carrying each day. And those things don't become important. So we mailed all of that ahead to Santiago for us to pick up at the end of the walk. Unfortunately, we soon realized we now had no information about where to sleep or eat. And we would go to the information center, but there was never anything in English. I 
I have to tell you, that was a little stressful. But as Bill said, somehow every night we did have a place to sleep and we did get some food. Um, I just want to tell you a quick little story. Uh, if you were lucky, you got in and there would be what they called a pilgrimage meal. And what was great about that meal was, not the meal itself, but it came with a very delicious bottle of wine. And no pot. It was like water to them. And Bill only drank coffee. So I got the whole bottle of Manta. It annoyed him that even when I had the precious wine, that glass of wine cost one-third the cost of his cup of coffee. <laughs> so at each Arbor Gay, I would look for a German, because the German, obviously one that spoke English, the Germans had the best guidebooks. And if I was lucky, that German and I would become good friends for about an hour. So <laughs> that is how I, we had some idea that if we go to this town, we might be able to find a place to sleep that night. Before the walk, I had asked Kate why someone would get up every day for 30 days, wear the same clothes, put on a heavy backpack, and walk. She told me it's just what one does, and she was right. Each day, you were gifted with the present moment. You never knew if that day the path would be rough. I don't know if you can see that, but that this was really hard to walk on. Or my favorite, sand, but sand was hard to walk on too, but certainly being close to the water was lovely. Out in the meadows, good. And let's see, one more maybe? Yes, this is taken at sunrise when Bill and I were leaving. And as you can see, it's just a, uh, a uh, like a cobblestone here. Bill walked faster than I did. So most days I would be walking alone in the fields, the forest, or the mountain area. Sometimes I was so caught up in the quiet beauty of the moment that I would later get nervous that I had not found a yellow arrow or a scallop shell sign. These, and here, you can't see it here, but I have a better picture of it. Those were, our, we had to find those to know if we were on the right path. Because you're out in the middle of nowhere. There's no, and, and though it went along the water, you couldn't always see the water. So I would uh, get really nervous. Um, had I, I would begin to pray. When I finally did see one in unexpected places, such as a tree trunk, I think I put that other one out, or on a rock, it could be painted, on a rock. And if you're really lucky, this is the way, no, this is the way you wanted to find it. Okay, but that was not often. It was more often where you were looking. And sometimes it would be in the ground. You'd have to look down and be in the dirt. So each time, even when it was raining, I would do my namaste to the sign. And I started to do, I'm not a practicing Catholic anymore, but I was raised as a Catholic. And I started doing my Catholic. <laughs> and I did it faithfully every time. Even when it was pouring rain and I had mittens on, I would take my mittens off and Bill can tell you, and I would go and then put the wet mittens back on. Because seriously, you're out there, those signs are everything. It's like the angels, finally, you're gonna make it back. So last item 
I had in my uh, backpack was uh, my rain pants and my wool hat and mittens, which I really was not planning on having to use. So, I'm going to share a few moments. Something I'm asked about a lot um, is how did I deal with the unisex bathroom? Well, for me, it was very liberating. I grew up with six siblings, and using the bathroom with the door open was a common event. So it was a non-issue for me. <coughs> Sometimes now, when I'm brushing my teeth, I'm reminded of the gorgeous French man in his tight black underwear, <laughs> joining me at the sink to brush his teeth. <laughs> Unfortunately, he did not speak English. But I'm not sure I could have talked anyway. Okay. <laughs> And then another time, a young German guy came in as I'm stepping out of the shower. Yep. Yes, I had my private covered with my towel, or actually with my scarf. Um, but the look of shock on his face, I don't know if he was just embarrassed, or as Bill said, he was shocked to see an old lady's body. <laughs> Another friend, he did the French route, spent one night at an arbitrary and could not sleep because of the noise, the snoring, the rustling when people turned over. For me, I just took out my hearing aid. <laughs> now, this is probably my most favorite moment on the walk. I am on top of the mountain. And I must say, Bill took these pictures. Um, so the credit for the photography goes to Bill. We had been uh, walking on the road because it, the rain the day before had washed out our path. We couldn't walk on it. It was like a, a stream. And walking on the road is not a comfortable thing. It's very hard on your legs. And uh, the road does not, it, it's curvy, and there's no uh, place to walk except right on the edge of the road. So when we saw this sign that said, alternate route up the mountain range, we decided to take it. I remember climbing up the first hill and getting to the top and seeing that the surface became flat. And I thought, oh, I can do this. Then we came upon a second hill to climb. The same scenario unfolded two more times. In fact, the last leg went straight up, no switch back, and was barely a foot wide of rough gravel. When I saw it, I said, I'm going to sit down and cry. <laughs> and with that, Bill, beeline for the path and left me. Of course I didn't sit down, much less cry, at least not out loud. But it's what it is, so I just started climbing. And when I got about halfway up, my foot slipped on the gravel. The backpack threw me off balance, and I fell again on my right back foot. Now I had another excuse for the pain in my butt. Finally, I did, I have to tell you, I was just thankful I didn't break anything. And when I finally made it to the top, there is Bill snapping. <laughs> and I thought, oh great, now he's rested and he's going to want to move on. So I decided to sit down and offer him half of my last chocolate peanut butter energy bar. And it did the trick. But I have to tell you, after a few minutes, I got up, and I just was looking down at the village, the water, and I just felt like I was on top of the world. One of the few moments in my life that I had the feeling of exhilaration. The story of another challenge became, began our first day of the walk, starting from Irun. By the way, someone asked me, if you flew into Madrid, how did you get up to Irun? And we took the train up to Irun. 
We left at the crack of dawn, and we followed that schedule for the remainder of the walk, which is at 7 o'clock. Because in Spain the day begins at 9 a.m., and then we got to the next other day before most others, and we could get a lower bunk. This was important for those nights when I needed to get up more than once to go to the bathroom. So, feeling good and ready to go, we set out for the first day of the walk. About two hours later, it became clear that we were lost and had to backtrack. Unfortunately, this happened a few more times during the walk. Again, because of poor directions and signage. One day, another moment, we arrived at our destination. We decided to push on down a steep slope instead of staying at the tent camp. By this time, my three toes are really hurting, and they're very, very painful. Going down is much harder than going up. When we got to the bottom, I took my boots off and put my sandals on. We continued on to one of the two other caves to find out that they were both closed. So Bill says, I guess we just have to trudge back up the steep incline. Do I need to tell you what I said? <laughs> Bill was stunned, saying he didn't think a good Catholic girl would use the F word not once, but three times. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I was a little stunned too. <laughs> But I did, and basically what I said over my dead body, will I ever go backwards on this walk? I am someone who likes to look forward and to put, keep putting one foot in front of the other. So we ended up waiting an hour for the bus to take us one town over. So in the beginning of our walk, there were many warm days. On the warm days, when your body was overheated from walking, I caused every little breeze a breath from heaven. I began to also talk to my mother, who died and passed over in 1999, and to her mother. And to her mother, my grandmother, asking for guidance and help to get through some difficult moments. A climb, the weather, the terrible pain in my toes, a feeling of being lost. I had never done this before the walk. And I never failed to thank them at the end of the day. For the first couple of weeks, we did have a little rain on and off. But 24 days into the walk, the rain was not only relentless, but the temperature dropped to almost freezing. I truly know what it means to be chilled to the bone. On top of it, we were out in the fields and the woods with no shelter until we got to our next place to sleep. After three days of this brutal weather with boots that were never, ever going to be dry again, I decided to end my time walking and cross this trek off my list. I had walked over 300 miles and was very happy that I had more than exceeded my expectation of three days. Of course, Bill trucked on. Would I do it again? After the walk, I was in the best shape I've been in since the summer I was 13 and I had 18 to 36 holes. I was 20 pounds lighter than I am today. There was not an ounce of fat on my body and I felt great if not a little tired. Yes, it was hard with the pain in my toes and in my backside, which it turned out was cancer. But time heals and you really only remember the romance of the adventure of a lifetime. Having said that, here's how I would do it again. I would do it like my sister and her husband did. That is, I would have a guide that moves away. He would take my backpack, no sleeping bag needed, <laughs> to the final destination of the day, which would be a very nice inn, waiting with my glass of wine in my private room and private bathroom. And in the morning, a delicious breakfast with coffee. <laughs> and if I needed to quit early in the day, there were different pickup points for a ride to the end. For me, the walking does draw me. You have no choice but to be in the present during such a walk. 
I never felt so alive as I did on top of the mountain. And stepping out of my comfort zone, but walking the El Camino is truly one of the highlights of my life. And I am thankful to Bill for allowing me to join him. I hope I have encouraged you to pick one thing you have thought was out of your comfort zone, but that you thought you might like to do. And I say, go for it. Do it. Thank you. reading it, I knew I was going to do it. I didn't know anybody who had done it, didn't hear the Camino before, but there was just something that said, hey, you know, we should do that. So I did buy the gear I needed to go with, so I thought, and I didn't have any point of reference because I didn't have anybody to check with, read a book. I certainly didn't, I had a few preconceived ideas which were <coughs> all wrong. And I did not have any expectations. Um, that was it. That's what drew me there. I had the most fabulous time, which I will tell a couple of things from that. But what drew me back the second time? Well, it certainly wasn't the possibility of more blisters, more bed bug bites, or broken bones, <laughs> or my personal bugaboo, which is the three-tiered bunk bed, and if you're the one that gets stuck in the middle, it's not pretty coming or going. That's all I can say. Um, I'd had such a wonderful set of experiences the first time, I, I just didn't think it could get any better. So I didn't have any expectation when I went back, other than just going for the sheer pleasure of walking in one of the best places I think you can. But beyond the physicality of the walk, <coughs> it is a wonderful opportunity to disconnect, to just unplug from our day-to-day -day lives and take a step back. And that step back is back to the basics of living. In the morning, as Paul said, you get up, you get dressed, you put that pack on, which has, albeit temporarily, <coughs> all your worldly possessions. You either get lucky and find a bar open early in the morning because they make the best cafe come last year. Or you might have to walk for a couple of hours. You get food, you might find a restaurant open, you might find little stores, kind of try and wrap pack, or pack wrap rather, some stuff just in case later or the next day you don't have food available. <laughs> at the end of the day, you seek lodging at an albergue. That's it, folks. That's it. Food, water, lodging. What more do you need? What could be more simplistic? I've been really fortunate to have some memorable experiences. And one was walking down into a valley that just had all these little paths, but you couldn't see them, so you could just see the contours of the hills. And I'm walking down. And I know there's other people out there, but I walk solo, so I don't see them. And all of a sudden, up and behind me, a trumpet starts to play. I remember. And so, so I listened, and 
much sat down on a, rat, a rock and listened. Probably was five or six minutes. It was just clear, almost melancholy, but just beautiful. And it stopped. Dead silence. And it's down there. Ole. And somewhere else. All these disembodied voices. Ole. Ole. Everybody applauding the gift we'd all been given. He didn't see anybody. So it's like a little bit of brigadoon going on. <laughs> Another one was <clears throat> at the end of a very cold, wet day, stopped in a very small village. And the albergue there was small. It was held maybe nine or ten people, and it was um, hosted by two women from Switzerland. And to work in an albergue, you have to have completed a Camino. So that you have a sense of what people have gone through and uh, can appreciate, you know, if they're struggling in the mud or the muck or the wind or the heat or whatever. So it was not very pleasant. And went in, and um, these two darling Swiss women had this little pot bellied stove all heated up and handed me a cup and anybody else that came in a hot espresso. And then on top of the stove, they were making little crepes. And they had filled them with homemade jam that they brought from Switzerland. And one woman said, now you must go across the road to the church and sing. <laughs> that seems dull. And you know, she said, oh no, she's quite insistent. I said, no, really, I'm, I'm going to be quite insistent. There will be no singing because I can't. But as I'm talking to her, I looked up, and here came this woman I had met two or three days before. And she sang with the German opera company. <laughs> and I said, I'm not singing, but I know who is. <laughs> and so eight or nine of us trudged over into this church that was about 700 years old, notorious for its perfect acoustics. So we made up this kind of little funny non-denominational service, and she sang. And then... It had been raining that day, and now it's clearing, and through, <laughs> it's just like I got a film, through the stained glass windows, the light is starting to shine, and she just turned and said, I, I would like to sing you one more song. I said, yes. And she sang, <laughs> Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And, uh, obviously, <laughs> you know, many years later, it was absolute perfection. So, just wonderful wonderful experiences, and I'll tell you one last one and then I'll stop, but at the end of the day, I was obviously in an albergue, and there was a lot of much younger people there. Anyway, we, it was a communal dinner, and then everybody just kind of threw in what they had, and at the end of the dinner, which had been rather short on food and long on wine, <laughs> the, there was some Frenchmen, and they challenged some Italians there to a grudge match on the soccer field because the French had not done as well as the Italians in the last World Cup. So all 35 or 40 of us trudged down there, and then they picked their teams. And for some unearthly reason, the Italians chose me to be their goalie. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I tell you, I've never had so much fun in my life. I, all these people, and there, there's 15 nationalities going on, but they all managed to come together. We had more fun. Even some of the villagers came out wondering, first of all, what the noise was and stayed to cheer. And it was fabulous. I, this, it was just sheer friendship coming alive. And I will tell you that the score was, for the Italians, about four, which, you know, in a soccer game. And the French won by about 32 points. <laughs> so, <laughs> what can I say? And I will say one other thing, to tag on. A few days later, I went into an albergue, and I looked up, and there were some of the Italians, and I thought, oh dear. And you know what they did? Everybody says all the Italians have to be Mr. Machuol. They didn't care about the score. They stood up and they applauded me. When I came in, they said, our goalie, our goalie. <laughs> so that was pretty great. So I, I've had 
more wonderful experiences than I can I can tell you anymore. The Camino for me was just first and foremost the joy of walking because I love to walk. Also, the unique camaraderie that comes with contact with other pilgrims, whether you can speak the language, their particular language or not, the kindnesses of a chocolate offered to you on a cold day or part of an orange that they share, help with your pack or your straps, getting them adjusted, whatever. And also there's a sense of accomplishment. It doesn't matter if you've done 300 kilometers, 500, 700, whatever. You did it. You went out there, you walked, you made it through those days. It's well done. Be proud. I am. And lastly, if anybody was going to ask me that question, would you ever do it again? Yeah. Not the French, but yes, I'll go back and do another route. That's it. Thank you for listening. Paul. are going to be available to you to come up and talk to. We went right through the question and answer period. We knew that because we wanted to hear as much of what they had to say as possible. So we don't have that this morning. But feel free to come up and look around and look at the photos and talk to both Kate and Paula. For the rest of you who aren't going to do that, we'd like you to pick up your chairs and stack them and get your coffee cups and take your conversation outside if you can so we can <coughs> clean up as quickly as we can. We thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you next week at our talk. What, turn on your cell phones. That's right. Woo! Got my cue. Thank you, everybody. It was a delight to be with you here this morning.